everybody and welcome back to another episode of The Male Perspective. I am your host, Lana Reed, and today, today on this day, I have with me Mr. Jonathan Harris. He is an award-winning author, TEDx speaker. He owns his own publishing company, and the list goes on and on and on, some of which I hope we get a chance to talk about today. But first and foremost, as I always do, I want to welcome you to the show and say thank you for making time for me. Time is a gift. Once you give it, you can't give it back. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to just get to connect with you further, get to connect with your uh, listeners and everything. So I can't wait. Awesome. Awesome. Your story is one of the ones that I really uh, enjoy hearing about. Um, and I'm going to start off with that and then we're going to trickle on down the way. But um, as I was reading about you getting prepared for today's show, um, it seems like at a young age, you started the path of being an achiever and a go getter. So what I would like to trouble you to do is kind of you know, share who you were as a little young guy and how you started this path into what we see today. So what all were you involved with as a young man? Oh my goodness. So I remember my mom and I, we still laugh about this to this day. She just brought it up last week. So I grew up in uh, Fort Washington, Maryland, which is a part of Prince George's County. I always call that like my own uh, Black Wakanda because you know, being a minority here in the United States, you always kind of see things from the standpoint of you're just the only one in the room. But growing up in Prince George's County, over 80 percent of the entire county, which is a, almost a million residents, are African-American. Mm -hmm. So I never really saw myself as a, you know, the only person in the room. I grew up with black doctors, black business mm -hmm. owners, black educators and different things like that. So I've always felt so positively charged as a kid, like, wow, like my neighbor is an engineer you know, my next door neighbor. So it was just so inspirational to see people who look like me doing these amazing things awesome. in the world. And uh, that just has always kind of been my fuel. I remember being, oh my goodness, uh, I would have been nine or 10, but I ran our elementary school store and my mom always laughs at me. She's like, you're the only kid I know who gets up, makes his own breakfast and just walks to school <laughs> and runs a school store. So <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we used to sell like school supplies. So kids would come and, um, you know, they need paper, notebooks, pencils, just different things like that. But I was doing that at like nine and 10 years old. I was a safety nice. patroller. So I've always been a person who valued structure. Um, I like, you know, order. I like structure. I like things like that. So I've always found myself connected to things that kind of uh, gave me structure. And, you know, from there, I just got involved with even more activities in middle school. I was the president of our homeless shelter awareness uh, society, just promoting, you know, ways to give relief and help to those less fortunate while just shedding light on the situation in general so people can be more sensitive. I've always did student government in high school. I was the president of my honor society. So I've always valued leadership opportunities when they've been given to me. Um, I'm the type of person that I don't necessarily need everything to be perfect when it's given to me. I can build something from nothing and I will definitely make it work and I will make it something that you will love. So that's just been me since I've uh, been, a, been a little kid. I love it. I love it. Now, listening to you um, talk, and some people might be um, hearing this um, and say, mm -hmm. you know, it's something about him. Th there's the blueprint, you know, and we want a lot of other young black boys to be able to follow uh, this mm -hmm. pattern that he set. What do you think are some key tips that really kind of helped you stay on path, walk that path and, and become the man that you are? Because I'm pretty sure a lot of parents, a lot of people out there would say we need to do what he's doing. That's a really good question. I think the biggest thing really comes from the home environment. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad is a very structured person and so is okay. my mom. We have about four file cabinets in our house. Like my parents are very orderly people. So it's oh. funny, like growing up, I, we're not like a, a mall walking window shopping type of family. Like I remember my parents would be like, you need to call the store, make sure it's there before you go. So they, <laughs> so they were, they're very much like people of time. They're not oh, okay. like, we're just going to walk the mall. We're going to go to the store and go out by aisle and see what we want. That is not them at all. They're the exact opposite of that. So like I grew up in the house with a lot of structure mm. and not in any, not like a, like a military base or anything like that. You know, my parents were definitely loving and flexible, but just in terms of like making sure that you respected yourself enough to respect your time. Gotcha. Um, so that was, that was like a really big thing. It's just kind of seeing how they did things. Um, 
you know, there's a place for everything. So my mom has a lot of folders and just really seeing the benefits of how growing up in a structured household really helps them in other areas. So we were never plagued with like late fees because they forgot to pay something or they forgot to do something or, you know, just those things. So uh, that was a really big help for me in terms of that blueprint you talk about. Structure, structure. And I think that um, a lot of times in our parenting uh, techniques, uh, we kind of forget that children really are are seeking some sort of pattern, some sort of, mm -hmm. no, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. And sometimes, you know, we, we kind of miss that as uh, parents. So it's very good that your, your parents had that innate ability in them because it makes life so much easier when you have some sort of plan in place yes. and all of that stuff. Um, but let me move on um, mm -hmm. because I can start talking about everything. <laughs> So I want to make sure I stay on task with you today. Um, but you're, uh, like I mentioned in the opening, you have some books, out, quite a few books out. Uh, the first yes. of which uh, was geared towards young men, which we were just talking about. So if you could yeah. tell me the title and what made you write that book? Sure. I always love this. The story is so funny because it's, it's, so just uh, organic, but the title is Master of Ceremonies, A Male's Guide for a Successful Life. And how it came about is I ended up getting a flat tire. And when I put the uh, car in the shop, I filled out the maintenance form incorrectly. So as a result, I ended up paying an extra $200 for a repair I didn't even need to do because I told the car mechanics that I needed a tune-up which deals with the wiring. So essentially I paid for the wiring of the car to get redone and I also played for a flat tire, even though I just needed the flat tire fixed. So after talking with my dad, he was kind of like, well, why didn't you call me and ask if you had any questions? And at the time I was 24 and, you know, with men, we can be so prideful, so prideful. And, you know, in your, your early 20s, you're kind of in that phase where you're trying to establish independency but you don't have it all figured out yet. And I think I got caught in the crossfires of trying to prove that I could really handle adulting on my own, but clearly I couldn't because mm -hmm. I messed up. Mm -hmm. And it was a very humbling self-check moment to say, had you called somebody who knew more about the subject area, which in that case was cars than you did, you wouldn't be in a situation where you're paying almost $300 for something that wasn't even supposed to cost you $100. So then it made me take an even bigger step back. And I said, well, what do guys do who don't have any type of male influence in their life? You know, I have an older brother at the time my grandfather was living. I have uncles. I had, you know, black male teachers. I have a father. Mm -hmm. And even I, like I said, still mess up on things. So what about the guys that don't have anybody to call when they have questions about buying the car, tying the tie? you know, moving out on your own or any of just those life skills, things that people go through, or even emotional things, you're having mm -hmm. trouble with a girlfriend or something like that. Who do they call when you don't have a support system? And that was really the fuel to write the book. You know, I acknowledge that a book will never take the place of a parent, but I do acknowledge that having some type of tangible resource to say, hey, you have a job interview. What are some things you should do to prepare for an interview could help. So that was really the, the root of where Master of Ceremonies came from. The title is because when you think about what an MC does, they're the host of the program. They control the energy. They control the direction. And you are the host of your own life. You are the mm -hmm. MC. We are just guests, but you run the show. So that was the, that was the whole focus was to really teach people how to be the best version of themselves and how to really make the performance the greatest they can because they're the host, but they're also the performer too. Awesome. I love it. Now, <laughs> listening to the story that you just told, um, you mm -hmm. mentioned that you have your grandfather, your father, there's you and your brothers. Um, and a lot of times what I'm seeing today, I mean, I guess it's, it's prevalent in every generation, but it seems like uh, past and previous generations were re really butting heads, right? Uh, right. So I'm, I'm curious to you, because you do have all of these generations in your life. What is it that us old folks are kind of missing uh, the mark about understanding what maybe the young folks are, are going through, the trials and tribulations that you have to deal with that we, we just don't seem to be getting or understanding. I love that question. Um, and I appreciate that question. I think the biggest thing that I've seen, and now, you know, as I'm getting older and I work with college age students, there is a generation gap there um, it's the whole obligation versus happiness debate where you see a lot of clashes. I think that people from previous generations, a lot of times in our experiences, made decisions based on obligation, 
right? So it was you hear stories of, I got this girl pregnant, so I have to marry her. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I need a stable job that I'm going to keep for 40 years until I retire so I can have a pension or different things like that. But people of today don't necessarily think that way. So sometimes you might find that uh, older generations think that we are either impulsive or don't have plans or don't have that. And that's because like we wouldn't marry somebody that we don't necessarily find happiness to. Whereas in previous generations, they kind of bit the bullet and did make those choices. And, you know, there's no judgment on either side. That's just a preference thing. Mm-hmm. But um, I think sometimes when you see those clashes, it's, it's really just a difference of value systems. Um, I know for me, I had a, a period of time where my family didn't understand my profession of choice because I went to school for something and then along the way decided I didn't want to do that for my life. So they kind of didn't understand, like, why would you give up the opportunity for a high paying job to go work in education where we traditionally know that educators don't make as much money as people who work in corporate America do. Right. Mm -hmm. So but again, that's that's a value system difference. So our generation values that whole you live once we might as well make it a life that we find happiness and not just one that pays the bills. So. Okay, Drake, Drake. Yeah. Oh, you only live. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, you mentioned that you chose to be in the educational field. And I, I read that you are a resident hall coordinator at uh, Lincoln, Lincoln University. Yes. So I um, actually. Well, hold, on, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 respect your elder. Let me put my rank here. Respect your elder. Yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> Lincoln University and Shaney University, y'all are in the same areas, and there's a big battle between the two of y'all, right? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, tell, there tell, is. tell the audience that they might not know what is the battle. Yes. So there is this big, we call it the battle of the first. (laughs) And uh, essentially what it represents is um, both Cheney University and Lincoln University are both uh, historically black colleges, or as you all may know them, HBCUs. And um, basically it's a battle of who was there first. So technically Cheney was the first to be created. However, at the time, the function of Cheney was more of like a a preparatory program, but it wasn't a place that you actually got degrees from. Mm -hmm. Lincoln, however, then came along in 1854 and actually did the grant, I mean, did grant degrees, which is why our flagship title is the first degree granting institution. So there's always this debate of like, can you say that you went to college if the college doesn't offer you a degree from it, right? Mm-hmm. So that that essentially is always the debate. But I mean, at the root of it, we always have love for our Cheney friends. Oh, we do okay. some uh, programs together here and there. Anytime we play each other in sports, you know, of course it's it's rivalry because they're about 30 minutes apart, but it's, it's still all love. It's still all towards the progression of people of color, so. Okay, yeah, it's just, yes. it's, it's just, Entertaining, entertaining. <laughs> yes, it definitely gets entertaining on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Oh my goodness, yes. But anyways, let's segue to what you do for Lincoln University. What is it that you do there? So I just celebrated my nine-year mark at Lincoln University, and you're um, only I'm twelve. Just, I'm so- you're only twelve. How did <laughs> you do that? I started when I was three. That's how I got there, and I'm twelve now. <laughs> so uh, basically, I. I not only work on campus, I actually live on campus. So I have a a kind of a dual excitement there because Mm -hmm. uh, in my role as now, my title is the Residential Academic Success Coach. I'm the first ever person in Lincoln history to have that job. So that's so cool to just be a part of history at a historic institution like Lincoln. But essentially what I do is I work with students every day, particularly our young men, and I'm their success coach. So we talk about their productivity. We talk about their schoolwork. We talk about their relationships, their mental health and pretty much all things that create barriers to students being successful. Uh, Today, I just had a student in my office, believe it or not, who was having some troubles with his girlfriend. So we had a whole conversation about just anger management strategies and what are some better ways to handle situations um, if you're frustrated, right? 
or when you feel hurt, who are some other people that you can talk to or, you know, just those different things. Sometimes I have students who, you know, are really good students, but they don't do well with taking notes or they don't do well with taking exams. So we come up with strategies on how you can just be more effective. So um, like I said, I work with the young men and I have a, a female counterpart who works with the young ladies as well. So a lot of the work that I do at Lincoln is centered around men's development. I run a program every Wednesday called Brother Circle, where guys just come out and it's just an open community chat. They can talk about whatever. Um, my only rule is they cannot commit to like confess the major crime. They can't be like, I just killed somebody. <laughs> but, but other than that, it's very free flowing. It's the one time like I'm kind of okay if they cuss because again, I don't want to censor venting. It's a little bit yes. hard to kind of get it out if you feel like well, Mr. Harris is watching. I can't really you know what I'm saying? So we were a little bit more lax during that, but I do brother circle on Mondays. I run my own mentoring program called project ignite. So we do life skills development. I bring in people to talk to them about different things. So our kickoff was actually this Monday, they learned how to cook. Um, next up, they're going to go over car maintenance. We're even going to do a series on men's safety. So how to defend yourself if someone's trying to attack you, or if you are the victim of a crime, how to identify a, a suspect or, you know, just different things like that. So uh, a lot of what I do is really just teaching, educating, mentoring, and I love it. Like I said, I've been here uh, nine yeah. years. I'm kind of like the campus uncle at this point, because yeah. even though I'm only 31, I've been here longer than most employees. So I have that kind of tenured status where now I'm working with like the little brothers of stu former students that I've had. And they're like, hey, when you get to campus, like look out for Mr. Harris. And I'm like, oh, that's always cool. So awesome. Awesome. Now, if you had to give advice to like an 11th or 12th grader in high school who's about mm -hmm. to make that transition to dorm life, what would you tell them? Because I know uh, eons ago when I was in the dorms freshman year, I lost my last peace of mind. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> what, what advice would you give to the senior about how to make that transition? It a little smoother because it's it's very different from going to mom and dad's house to hey i'm i'm here just living the life i love that so um and this is something that i live by but i think it works perfectly for students going to school which is think about the end goal everything always goes back to an end goal so if you know that you come into college is because you want to be a doctor every single decision that you make should be set up towards pushing you towards being that doctor so um with my weight loss, I have this before and after picture of like how I used to look versus how I look now. And every decision I say is like, Jonathan, is this action pushing you back towards the old you or is it keeping you at the current you? And that's literally how I make decisions. In terms of like a long-term career goal I have, I actually want to ultimately move back to Prince George's County and I want to run for political office. So I think about that, like if I'm doing something on social media or just out in the world, I'm like, Jonathan, would this help you when you go campaign? Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, probably shouldn't be doing it, definitely shouldn't be posting about it. But I say all that to say, um, that's what I teach my students is, how is this behavior helping you get to your goal? It's not. Okay, well, why are we doing it? Are you looking to get friends? Are you looking for, you know, acceptance? Are you bored? Whatever that is. So, you know, we talk about those things, but that's the advice I would give is what is your end goal? What do you want out of your life and how is college there to help you? Awesome. Awesome. You know, that's the one thing um, now that I have gone through the different seasons of my life and experienced certain mm -hmm. things. I, that's one of the, the beautiful things I can say about HBCUs is they're a lot more nurturing and allowing the individual to grow and blossom into their best best selves. Um, yes. You know, for us as Black folks that went to predominantly white schools, uh, we kind of, you know, it was fight, it was fight your way through it where we didn't get Absolutely. that nurturing. And I mean, it's truly, truly a blessing. And it's, it's a beautiful thing that I've seen from everybody who's attended at HBCU. Um, yes. Now, you mentioned that you had a weight loss journey and you embarked on this in the middle of the pandemic. So what's this? The going through somebody's head said, hey, we're in the middle of a pandemic. You know, I think I want to lose weight. Who does that? <laughs> so a big thing for me was um, I got to a space when I was tired, you know, and I believe in life. You can't make any changes until you hit that rock bottom like I'm tired. And uh, at that point, I remember I knew the, the final straw for me. I was crying on the phone to my dad. And I was just like, I don't want to be this person anymore. And usually I'm a pretty, you know, level headed person. Most people who know me would know me to be a very calm, always a person who thinks logically over emotion. 
But in that case, I was just so emotional about the situation. I remember um, I was having some really bad wrist pains and just different things. And I felt like I was getting sick. And I think one of the worst things that a person should ever do, do not do this if you are watching or listening. Um, I know that there are online platforms and databases that might tell you potential illnesses based on your symptoms. That thing is really scary. So like, I remember looking up like what I was experiencing and they were like, you could be diabetic. And that just like sent me into a whole like frenzy of like, oh my goodness. And I'm not, but again, like going off of the internet who doesn't fully know your whole whatever is just you're literally just typing in symptoms and they're taking the estimate of what they think you might have but I like really took that to heart and I was like oh my god I'm thinking of how inconvenient that process would be to have to you know go see a doctor and different things and I just remember even like thinking about how inconvenient that might be to my family and other people who might need to help take care of me if it got really bad or something and I just remember being so kind of like panicky and worried and I'm that none of those of what I just mentioned is me at all so it was a very like outer body experience to see myself so like helpless and I'm like Jonathan like who have you become in this last week like you're crying you're hysterical you're all like none of that is me and I remember like telling my dad, like, I don't want to be this. Like if that, you know what I'm saying? If, if a situation has me that upset, then we need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, I had a serious talk with myself about what I was eating, uh, what I was drinking, you know, exercise habits, sleeping, like anything that was kind of getting in the way. And, you know, I worked on it almost every day from cutting back uh, juice and soda and alcohol to this day, I still only drink water. I don't, I haven't had juice, soda or alcohol in the longest. Awesome. Uh, some days I may just walk two miles. Some days I've done as much as 10 miles, right? It really just varies, but yeah, I've actually lost 120 pounds and I have no intentions of, thank you. I have no intentions of gaining it back. You know, obviously some weekends are better than other. You're going to have those special occasions where you should celebrate and maybe mm -hmm. you're not being the most food conscious, but I make sure that those days are far and few in between. It's not like every single day we're doing cheesecake or just these different things that might kind of offset our progress. So now I've grown to a space where, you know, I get to educate others, which I love. I've done workshops for my community. Uh, you know, I work on a college campus. So this is where I really like to tie it all together because college students don't really give much context to help at all. They're not thinking about the gym. It's like, let me go order this, this is Domino's at midnight because yes. we didn't really like what the cab had. And there's all of these different things. So I've been able to do health-based programming and it's cool because my students enjoy it. We have conversations around mental health. We talk about safe sex. We talk about diet and exercise. And a lot of times when I go for my campus walks, because like I said, I live here, I bring them with me. So my students are also working out while we're building relationships, while we're awesome. talking about their stress level. So I haven't just tried to do it where like I'm losing the weight. I've tried to bring others with me too. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. I love, love, love that. Anytime we can keep a brother healthy, because sometimes, yes. boom. Um, now I'm going to segue here because it just came to my mind and I have to say, mm -hmm. um, as a black man who has, uh, attended college, mm -hmm. um, I'm always curious. I always like to ask when I stumble across you guys, what is it that we can do to encourage more brothers to go to pursue higher education or trade school? Because I think it's very important that, um, we get more of you educated in some sort of sense and it doesn't have to be college and that's what i, I like to tell right, you right. it doesn't have to be college but what what is it that we can do possibly to kind of move you guys that way i love that and thank you for asking um there are so many different things that you can do i think the biggest thing is honestly it's support uh sometimes the desire may be there but they you know guys we may not know the intimate steps uh, so maybe that's, hey, do you want me to help you with your resume or help mm. you with the application or those types of things? And then I think the even bigger piece is helping be a part of a man's village once he goes to school. Are we calling and checking in? Are we sending care packages? Yes. Are we just providing just, hey, I, I just wanted to tell you that I'm proud of you. I think that uh, in my experience, the, the students who do the best are the ones who are the most connected. Gotcha. And the ones who aren't performing to their standard is because they're trying to take on the world by themselves. So 
I would just say continuing to just love on those individuals and just seeing where you can aid in his life. It'll do wonders. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. I got two more questions. So hang in there with me. I know I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm over my time, but I want to make sure I get to this. Um, you tell a story because I was reading on um, your blog. You tell a story about uh, when you were 17 years old, or something that happened mm -hmm. to you. And the, the, yes. theme of, the theme of it is don't let anybody take your power. And I think everybody needs to hear that. So if you could kind of share that story sure. with us. And Absolutely. So when I was 17 years old, I was the victim of a in-house uh, burglary. I was actually home by myself. Uh, my mom had just left to go to work. And um, three guys later on, I found out actually with a gun had tried to break into our home. I was able to successfully get out. Um, no one was hurt or injured or anything like that in the process. However, uh, several things from our house were taken. Um, and it was truly one of the worst days of my life. It's a very odd experience to know that someone would really violate your home like that, especially someone you don't know. Um, the, the situation is always a little bit tricky because you always hear about closure being this thing where you get to talk to the person or you get to that. Like I, I, you know, never seen them again, or if I have, mm. I, you know, wouldn't have recognized them. There was no court case or any type of like brought to justice moment. It kind of just happened. Mm. Um, and I had to heal from it. I had to go to counseling for a little bit. I had to, you know, really give it a lot of time. I, I know. So it took place on August 4th, 2007. So August 4th, I'll be very honest. Every single year, it does something different. Some years it holds no impact at all. Some years it is very heavy on my heart. Uh, sometimes when I watch movies where the movie deals with the burglary, I might think about it really quick. Mm -hmm. So it, it has different kind of lasting effects. But again, I am a strong willed person. So I always am thinking about how I can just continue to stand on the principles of like, you know what, Jonathan, you're safe, you're alive. God still has you here for a purpose. That's why you weren't killed. That's why nobody that you know was hurt or harmed. So even though this is a terrible thing to happen to you, um, I've had to grow to a space and, you know, I can honestly say, you know, on record that I have forgiven those individuals who have done that. And it's hard because I don't get to tell them that I don't, you know, obviously know them, but um, I always pray for them. Like, I hope that they're doing well. I hope they've grown out of that season in their life that they feel the need to steal or, you know, cause crime or mischief. So, yeah, um, for anyone who has ever gone through a situation, uh, whether you got the closure you wanted or you didn't, you know, I'm praying for your healing. And um, I hope that you're able to forgive that person or those people who may have wronged you unjustly. Beautiful, beautiful. Bitterness, carrying bitterness around is, is not going to help your life in any kind of way at all. Yeah, yeah. no, not at all. Yeah, so it's, no. um, like I said, it's... Um, it's hard. I'd be lying to you if I said, like I said, some days it might just hit you out of nowhere, but um, I'm grateful because again, for the line of work that I do, I have books out. Um, I work at a school and I have students who've gone through some very horrible things as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful if, if not for anything else, I'm grateful, you know, never to like overshadow or anything that a student shares with me, but being able to just better empathize. Yes the feeling of someone doing you wrong, even though your situation might not have looked like mine, but I can better understand how betrayal feels because I do have those life experiences. So I always just relate it back to that. I give thanks to God for being able to help me better connect with people as a result of the things that I've gone through. Awesome. Such a blessing you are to others. Such a blessing. And I like that you, um, you said that you went to therapy and that's another thing that I'm really big mm -hmm. on is getting uh, black men to say, you know, I need some help and to admit that I need some help and I need to go see somebody. And I'm, I'm starting to see a, a lot more of you guys, you know, sit down and talk to somebody. And then I think that's a beautiful thing. And the more you, of you guys that get out there and say, Hey, I went, I feel better. It's okay. Yes. There's no stigma behind it, you know? So mm -hmm. you know, that's a beautiful, because you can't, you can't carry the weight all by yourself. Sometimes you have to, you know, help somebody, have somebody help you process it so that's a beautiful thing um let me get to this last thing on the list mm -hmm. uh your excellence uh Thank now you. after you wrote the book uh the first book you said hey I, i'm gonna write some children's books 
I mean, yeah. where where did you segue? What, how did that come about? Um, so I can honestly say to you that all of my books, I don't want to use the word accident because everything is a part of a greater divine purpose. But what I would say is that it wasn't on my thought process. How it worked is when I put out the first book, Master of Ceremonies, and I was uh, doing some touring, I set up my own book tour and everything, and I was out and about. I was finding that I was meeting a lot of moms with like younger kids, like babies, toddlers. And you know, with my first book, I'm talking about life skills for young adults. So I'm going over how to travel to an airport by yourself, how to manage an apartment, cooking and things like that. So the content wasn't age appropriate for a toddler or a baby. You know, the first book doesn't have anything inappropriate. But again, these are things that you'd probably start to deal with as a teenager or, again, just a young adult. So I remember um, that was a lot of the feedback I was getting when I tried to sell to certain people. It's just like my child is just not old enough to really be able to appreciate some of the things that your first book covers. So at that point, I was like, hmm, well, what if I created something that still had the same theme of self-help, but I could apply it to a younger audience? And that's where Growing Gents came about. Mm -hmm. So the book talks all about just different things that we want a kid to either think about or to be. So it talks about punctuality. It talks about saving mm -hmm. money. It talks about um, saying please and thank you and keeping your room clean and just all of these different values, but they're all illustrated through animals. So when it says a gentleman keeps his room clean on the page, you see a turtle making up his bed and putting oh. away his toys in a, in a way that a, that, a, that a child would appreciate. Yes. But it's still teaching those value systems. Um, that's, you know, what all my books are about. They're really resources for people. Um, I think these are perfect things for parents or aunties or teachers or whomever to read to their their young ones. So like, for example, again, with the saving money part, it says a gentleman saves his money and you'll see a kangaroo putting a dollar in his pouch. So I'm oh. hopeful that at a young age, we can teach financial literacy. So if somebody gives you money, you don't have to run to the ice cream truck and immediately spend it. You can, you can build a savings. And imagine how much better our world would be if our, our young mm. kids got those life lessons early where they valued saving, they valued manners, they valued chivalry and all of these other things. In terms of Girls with Pearls, at that point, I had already put out Master of Ceremonies, and then I had announced that I was working on Growing Gents. So even though people were excited for me, I started to get a little bit of criticism because they're like, all right, so you have this book for males already out. Now you're working on the second book for little boys, but you don't have anything for girls. So they were like, when are you going to do something for the girls? I'm like, okay, I got y'all. Give me some, give me a second. So I started thinking about concepts for girls with pearls. So one day I'm at Red Lobster with a friend and I'm working on this girls with pearls book. And I asked the uh, waitress, you know, what is something that you would want your daughter to know or do by the time she turns 18 years old? So she tells me that, you know, I want my daughter to love herself. And I remember her saying, I want my daughter to value her education before a man. So what I did not know is that she loved the topic of what I was working on so much. She asked that same question to every single woman in Red Lobster. Yes. And she comes back to the table with a slip and it's all of the responses of every single woman of the same question I asked, which was, again, what would you want your daughter to know by the time she's 18? So that was the motivation as to where Girls with Pearls came about. So shout out to the ladies of Red Lobster. <laughs> um, yeah, so I didn't know that. Like I'm, I'm sitting there like enjoying lunch with a friend and she's like going around like, yeah, this guy's writing a book over there. And like, <laughs> he was really excited, uh, which is which is really cool. Uh, I'm, I'm so grateful, you know. Yeah. And it was so important because a lot of times you see in the world, people make decisions for uh, different groups of people and don't include that group. So again, I'm a man. So I'm writing a, you know, a book for girls. Now, granted, it, it has similar concepts to growing gents, but how can I make a book for girls and not in, consult any women? That just wouldn't make mm -hmm. any sense. But again, people do that every day. So, you know, that that's not how I do business. So um, I'm appreciative of every female, including my, my own mom, who 
you know, provided insight on how this book should be made. So the colors, schemes are a lot different, you know, instead of like earth tones or different things like that, it has more pink, it has more purple. I'm so grateful. So the illustrator who worked on the boys book also worked on the girls book. So I, I always joke, I call them the boy girl twins. They're like brother and sister because the mm -hmm. concepts are pretty much identical. But Girls With Pearls does have more content because of the fact that the women of Red Lobster, as well as my mom, had additional things that they felt like should be included in a girls book that maybe I didn't think of for the boys book. So awesome. So, I love that. I'm house. so, so grateful. Awesome. And the, how every, the community just kind of came around and said, hey, we're going to pour yes. into this project as well. That's beautiful because you you hear so many stories of today's world where you know, everybody's on their own and doing their own. They really care about. So the fact that people came together and, you know, helped you out with I, I, I just loved it. So tell me, Mr. Harris. What, you know, give me a sneak peek. You working on something else we need to know about? I am. So book number four is coming soon. Um, so, you know, a little bit ago, we talked about the health journey. So I'm actually writing about how I lost weight, how it came about, why I started, what I learned while I was doing it, life after meeting the goal and everything that a person wants to know. Um, I'm so grateful that we have personal trainers and nutritionists and doctors and all of these great professionals in the world. But I also do realize that a really great perspective to hear from is a person who was in your shoes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at my heaviest, I was 340 pounds and I'm not ashamed to say it. Um, but I do understand that there are health complications that may come with being that size. Mm -hmm. Um, I am not that anymore. I'm in the 220s and I'm, you know, going to continue to work on my fitness and, you know, build more muscle and just continue to be a healthy person, not for a certain weight number, not for appearance purposes, but just to be healthy. Yeah. And I know that there are a lot of people in the world who really want to work on their health too, but sometimes we're afraid because we don't know where to start. We feel like the goal is too big. We feel like, I'm never going to be able to give up my habit of loving chips and just these different things that we consider to be everyday barriers. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that, you know, my background is not health science. It's not biology. I didn't go to school for science, but I did stay committed. I prayed about it. I leaned on my village of people who love me to hold me accountable and just different things like that. I'd like to think that my steps were reasonable things that a per any average day person can do to lose weight. And more importantly, if all else fails, I am living proof because I did it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that my book really gives hope to the average person. Um, I'm not speaking from the standpoint of a scientist who's going to give you the science of losing weight. I'm going to speak to you from the, the cognitive, the mental standpoint, you know, because I was too in your shoes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm excited to put this book out into the world. Awesome. Somebody relatable. Because sometimes, you know, we look at all these people and, and we have no connection to them. They're not really somebody that we would think we would walk into the grocery store and say, hey, you know, Mr. Harris did mm -hmm. it, John did it. Oh, I can do it too. You know, and, right. and like you said, um, you know, a lot of times it just seems so far reaching, you know, uh, I'm gonna have to give up this. I'm gonna have to get, and no, it's a lifestyle change. Yeah, you can have that. Mm -hmm. And you, and then also sometimes the task seems so overwhelming, but as I was yeah. always told, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a one time. Bite at a time. <laughs> one bite at a time. <laughs> so that's it. So let me do my random question, Mr. Harris, and then sure. we will talk about how we connect with you so let's do my my little random here let's see what we got i'm excited oh, i don't know let's see what the question is first oh okay well we already talked about this one i don't know maybe um i'm gonna ask the question and then if we you can ask me t t if you sure. want another one what is the most useful thing your mom or dad has taught you oh my goodness so that is funny because we did start out that way um I guess a little bit different piece of advice. So my mom and my dad, lovely people. I love them to pieces. Um, my dad's biggest thing that he always taught me is that you can't straddle the line between being a boy and a man. And that really helps me grow up. Uh, 
a lot. Because sometimes, you know, we want man privileges, but when it goes wrong, we want boy consequences. That's so right. I, I always try to make sure everything I do, like, you know, you do what you can stand. And I try to really stand behind my actions, good, bad, or indifferent. So that helps me hold myself accountable is that I'm not a boy, I'm a man. And I have to always carry myself as such. I love uh, In turn, thank you. In terms of my mom, uh, the biggest thing that I get from her is she's the person that when you put your name on it, you do it in excellence. So making sure that you are representing yourself well at all times. I'm so grateful because it, it helps me even just in terms of like interacting with women myself, like having a mom with, you know, strong moral fibers and things like that helps you know what you shouldn't be settling for. Mm -hmm. My mom is in goodness, in the 31 years that I've known my mom, I've never seen her come out the house looking crazy. Like, you know what I'm saying? She's a person who always takes pride in everything she does. She doesn't throw anything together last minute. She's always very intentional. She'll be late to something before she comes looking crazy. And I'm appreciative of that because she values the essence of making sure that she presents herself to the world in the best way that she wants to be known. So I, I very much try to be the same way. Love, 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 love mom and dad. So, <laughs> yes. uh, Mr. Harris, tell us how we pick up the books, how we connect with you. I didn't get any to the TED uh, talk speaker, but I'm sure you do public speaking. So how do we, we get in touch with you for everything? Yeah, so that's, um, I'm so fortunate in the sense that like my username works for every platform. No one took it. So <laughs> for Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, even what Clubhouse, Snapchat, PlayStation Network, if you're a gamer, <laughs> uh, it's Author John, A-U-T-H-O-R-J-O-N for everything that I just mentioned. So if you go to pretty much any um, social media platform site and type in Author John, there I am. Same thing for my website, which is www.authorjohn dot com. So if you need a speaker, if you need a personal coach or a group coach or anything, if you're trying to write a book, if you're trying to lose weight, if you just need help with your confidence or your productivity or any of those things, I also do work with people one-on-one uh, -on -one as well. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, tell mom and dad and the village that surrounds you that they did an excellent, excellent, phenomenal, phenomenal job. And Thank you. I truly appreciate the example that you were giving, um, what you were doing, who you are, who you're becoming. I'm looking forward to seeing you in 10 years and 20 years and just all of the excellence that you will pour into this world. So thank you for everything that you are doing. I truly, truly appreciate it from little old me in my little corner of the world. Aww. Thank you so much. I'm really glad that we had a chance to connect as well. And thank you. I when you know when we were in touch i absolutely fell in love with your uh, title of your show i think it's great to have a space where you know men can just kind of come on and talk and i think the cool part about being you know a person is we all bring something different to the table but it's all still relative to just the greater progression of the world so um thank you for being a champion for change a catalyst for just growth and all of that so we appreciate you too Awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, folks, that is all for this week's episode of The Male Perspective. I am your host, Lana Reed, and I will see everybody next time. Oh.